Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Ross, and I'm coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory here in Sarasota, Florida. Now, in case you don't know where in the world we are, we are on the west coast of Florida, about an hour south of Tampa, and we are a world-famous scientific institution that has lots of amazing ocean scientists studying lots of different aspects of ocean conservation, sustainability, and just science in general. Now, we are so fortunate to be joined by two amazing scientists who are part of Moat Marine Laboratory. Now, today's program, as I'm sure you guessed by the title of our webinar, is the the science of summer. Now, undeniably, when you think summer, you got to think of the beach. And we are going to be learning all about what you can do to make a sustainable beach visit. So how can you make your beach day both scientific and fun? And we are going to be connecting to two amazing moat scientists to learn about what their research is at moat and what they do in order to provide sustainable and healthy beach ecosystems for you to enjoy, as well as what you can do to continue to make their research easier and keep those beaches healthy. So we're going to have a radical time hanging out and learning some gnarly science. But before we dive in, we're going to have a very interactive webinar. Now, not only are you going to be able to have some Q&A questions and answers at the end of our presentation with our amazing scientists, but we're also going to be keeping you on your toes because just because it's summer break doesn't mean that we're not assigning homework, right? So we're going to be doing some live interactive polling questions throughout this presentation as well. See how much you know, how beach savvy you really are. So let's start with our first polling question just to get everyone's juices flowing. So for question number one, what do you think are some stressors to sea life during the summer? So you have three different options. Go into the polling question, polling feature on your Zoom page. So do you think snow cones and soft serve stress out sea life? Do you think sand castles and sunscreen stress out sea life? Or do you think sandals and stargazing stress out sea life? Now, I know that we have a lot of people joining us from around the United States, from the West Coast to the East Coast. So I wonder what the guesses are going to be. I mean, granted, if I don't have soft serve when I'm at the beach, I get pretty stressed, but I wonder how that pertains to sea life. I feel like during the summer season, I'm pretty much a marine mammal too. So I wonder what the majority of people are thinking. Now, it does look like so far out of the majority of the people, everyone is guessing sandcastles and sunscreen. How can that possibly be? Well, before we dive in and shed the answer to see who is actually correct, we're going to turn it over for our current events and news segment with our wonderful PR manager, Stephanie Kettle. And then we'll be back to introduce our guests and see who had the correct answer. I'm Stephanie Kettle, and here's the news that's making waves. Nesting season officially began in our area on May 1. This is the lighting furniture. For weekly updates on nesting numbers and for tips to keep turtles safe. Over Mother's Day weekend, most stranded investigations team helped save not one, but actually two manatee lives. Biologists responded to an injured manatee with fresh boat strike wounds, and they assisted in a coordinated rescue of the manatee. Once she arrived at SeaWorld Orlando for rehabilitation, the manatee was discovered to be pregnant, and then she later gave birth to a healthy calf. Mom and calf are under the watchful eye of a team of veterinarians at SeaWorld, and with the aim to release her and her calf as soon as she is recovered. Visit our Facebook at Moat Marine Lab to see the full video. With summer vacation right around the corner, it's a good time to remember all our boating tips to keep our local marine life safe. Polarized lenses and a spotter can help you detect animals in the water. Abide by all posted slow wake zone signs. Do not feed, water, or harass manatees, sea turtles, or dolphins as they are protected at both state and federal levels. What do you do if you see a deceased or distressed manatee, dolphin, whale, or sea turtle? In the state of the area, be sure to call Moat's trained responders at our 24-hour hotline at 941-988-0212. If no one answers, they may be busy responding to another call, so please leave a message. And lastly, here's a fun story about social distancing for you involving a whale shark. Massive whale shark Rio Lady was tagged by moat researchers back in 2007. She eluded researchers for many years after that, only to be found again in 2018 by another group at Nova Southeastern. 
Once again, she's on the move, this time traveling about 9,600 miles in the last 20 months. Read more about her epic journey at move.org slash news. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that really factual and trendy and contemporary beach-based news segment. Now, I'm sure the moment you've all been waiting for, we get to meet our two amazing guest experts joining us today, and they'll be the ones to see who had the correct answer, to see if all of you really do think sandcastles and sunscreen are the biggest threat to sea life. So we are going to turn it over to our two amazing guest experts. We are joined by Dr. Eileen Maldonado through Moat's Environmental Toxicology <laughs> Program. Oh my gosh, how cool is that? And we are joined by Melissa Bernard, who is part of the Sea Turtle Research and Conservation Program here at Moat. So, oh my gosh, we are so excited to have some very amazing women in science joining us today. And let's see. So as the experts on summer topics and all things summer science, what was the correct answer? Did our audience poll get it correct? We'll turn yeah. it over to, yes, either or, whoever wants to speak first. Definitely sunscreen is definitely a concern right now that I'll elaborate on later, but yeah, sunscreen is definitely the correct answer. Awesome, and then Melissa, does that mean that sandcastles are also a stressor? They can be. Obstacles on the beach of any kind can cause a problem for uh, nesting sea turtles as well as hatchlings. Oh man, well I cannot wait to dive in and learn more about this. But before we talk about the science of summer, we got to understand who these amazing guest experts are. So let's start with Dr. Maldonado. So who are you? What is your job? Ecotoxicology sounds like a really fancy title. Tell us a little bit more about what you do here at Moat and who you are. So yeah, my name is Dr. Eileen Maldonado and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Moat Marine Laboratory in the ecotoxicology department. And that's basically after you finish your PhD and before you're a professor, you have this in-between thing and that's kind of what I'm doing. Uh, mainly focused on research, mentoring. Um, in the ecotoxicology program, we are mainly focused on how natural toxins and human pollution affect marine animals. And we know red tide is a big issue right now. And we spend about 50% of our labs dedicated to, uh, or more is dedicated to red tide research and trying to find ways we can mitigate that and kind of help decrease the impacts of red tide, as well as looking at uh, pesticides, sunscreen and other compounds that humans make and how they might hurt animals and might they might impact animals. Um, coral specifically is something that we're very interested in. Um, we look at oysters and hard clams locally and uh, fish species as well um, and different chemical cues. So kind of that's a little bit of an overview of the kind of research we're focused on in our lab. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Melissa, tell us a little bit more about what you do and what is the Sea Turtle Research and Conservation Program here at Moat? Yeah, so my name is Melissa Bernhard. I am the Senior Biologist and Conservation Manager of the Moat Sea Turtle Conservation Research Program. We are focused on um, sea turtle patrols for uh, 35 miles of Sarasota County's uh, nesting beach population. So we go out every day during sea turtle nesting season and document all uh, nests and anything that's happening to those nests as well as um, tagging turtles at night and that sort of thing so <laughs> that is so cool what a totally awesome job right <laughs> <laughs> now we are talking to two amazing experts who work with very different animals so we have a reptile specialist we have an invertebrate specialist so we have a coral scientist we have a sea turtle scientist so i want to see if there's any commonalities do you have any shared crossovers do what does your average day look like? So Dr. Maldonado, what, when you come to Moat and you are doing ecotoxicology, working with environmental chemistry, some of the stuff we can't even see, it's too, too small for the naked eye. What does your lab look like? What does an average day look like for you? Assuming you even have an average day. Um, well, luckily in the scientific world, every day is really different than the next day. I don't think we would do the same thing every day, which is kind of the cool part about being a scientist. Uh, when I go in the lab, usually I spend more time in the lab than probably the turtle people do because uh, <laughs> we have to measure those compounds and see how much of them are in there. And a lot of people don't know, but that takes 
not as easy as you just put it on something and it tells you how much there is. It's a lot of effort and work that goes into understanding how much sunscreen is in the water. Uh, it actually takes a lot of processing. So we go into the lab, I will have many interns and uh, lab techs and people I work with every day and each person's doing their own projects. We'll maybe doing an exposure experiment to see, okay, well, how much toxin does the clam accumulate of red tide? And so we'll be dosing them with red tide and looking over time. So every day I'll go in and see how the clams are doing, um, taking samples from them, taking water samples. That might be a day or I might spend a day on the instrument, which is this big instrument that we use to measure the compounds, which is called an LCM SMS. And I might be spending the day analyzing data. There are fun days though. Sometimes we get to go in the field and collect samples and see how much red tide toxins there, or how many other pollutants are in the water. So. Um, in the future, kind of in the next year, we're going to do coral surveys and looking at pollutants and corals. And so that'll be diving and collecting tissue samples from corals. So really every day is really different than the next. Gosh, that is so cool. So whether you're in the lab or underwater, that is amazing that you're making that much of a difference pretty much from the very bottom of the ocean food chain all the way up to the top. So thank you so much for that. That's amazing. Now, Melissa, what does your average day look like? Now, I know that we're ramping up for nesting season, so I'm sure your day is busier now than it used to be. And in fact, where did you just come from? And I hear that you might have some excellent news for us. <laughs> yeah, our day is a little bit different. Um, we start uh, during nesting season, which is six months of the year, we start the day on the beach. So I literally just maybe an hour ago just got in from all of my field work today. Um, we patrol the, all, all of the beaches looking for new nests, documenting the new nests, staking them off to protect them, um, and then uh, collecting data. And so I just got into the office where we do all of our data entry. Um, we're usually uh, pretty busy out there, um, and uh, we are definitely ramping up right now. We just started sea turtle nesting season, and so we are on the upswing of nesting. Uh, hatching will begin sometime in early July, probably. Uh, so that will keep us busy for July, August, September, and October. Um, and then in the off season is where we do all the boring stuff like the, uh, the office work for getting our reports ready and, and preparing for our permits. Um, but last night, uh, our nighttime tagging team actually was able to re-satellite tag a turtle that was originally tagged in 1988. So um, it was very exciting to see that. That means that this turtle is at least 57 years old and she's still nesting on our beaches here. And she's been seen many, many years uh, since then. So it's very exciting to see her come back. Gosh, that is so great. Awesome news. I'm sure you're pretty shell-shocked to see her <laughs> revisit our beaches after that many years. Yes. So exciting. Now, before we dive in and learn a little bit more, I do see that we have some awesome questions that are coming into the chat box. So Sharon, thank you so much for your awesome sunscreen related question. We will promise to get to all of your questions right at the end. We have the last 10 to 15 minutes of this program dedicated just for questions. So I promise we're gonna do a little setup right now and then open it up to our audience. Now, before we go back to learning a little bit more about what Eileen Maldonado does, we're gonna play a little video for you. So we're gonna queue up an awesome video to show everyone what some of Moat's coral reef research labs look like. Now for this video, we're going to be actually going all the way down to Moat's Keys location because believe it or not, Moat actually has six different science campuses located all around the state of Florida, whether it's our main campus up in Sarasota or all the way down in the Florida Keys we are going to be looking at some of the awesome labs that Dr. Maldonado gets to work in every single day. When we jump back from this video, we'll talk to Dr. Maldonado so she can walk us through what we just saw. All right, we'll be right back. If you want to do good field research, you usually need a good support system. Moat's new building allows us to have that. At IC2R3, we have incredible capabilities of collaborating with dry lab space and field support. In addition to all that, there's a wet lab environment, both indoor and outdoor. Ocean acidification has been called things like the evil twin of climate change or the other carbon dioxide problem. 
it is causing some difficulties for organisms that live in the ocean. What's really great about this facility is our capacity to really replicate a lot of communities and these numerous raceways. This is a really great place to do ocean acidification research. So here in the Molecular Biology Laboratory, we incorporate multiple different molecular techniques to look at the DNA of different organisms. What I love about the research labs here at Moat Marine Laboratory is that we offer so many resources that will help answer so many questions. Understanding disease dynamics in relation to coral reefs is incredibly important for trying to allow these reefs to recover and become some type of ecosystem similar to what we've had in the past. What we'll do is we'll take a large piece of coral and cut them into centimeter squares. And so the idea is that we're reskinning the reef and we're also making the corals sexually mature faster so that, that they can, within two and a half to three and a half years, reseed the reefs themselves. The real key is the way in which we're putting them out the densities and the genotypic diversity. We have several hundred structures, each growing 100 corals or more. Because moat is down here, we can work on tens of thousands of corals at a time. They provide protection from shoreline by absorbing wave energy. They provide novel sources for compounds that we can use to fight things like cancer or antibiotic resistant bacteria. And they're the foundation for tourism and the fishing industry of the state of Florida and are estimated to be worth at least $6 billion to our state economy. And so I think informing the public is really the biggest way to enact change. If the public doesn't know what's happening, how can we fix anything that's happening in the ocean? So amazing that we get to see some of our coral scientists, whether it's in our ocean acidification lab, whether it's in our disease lab, or whether it's in Dr. Maldonado's lab on, look, on ecotoxicology. So Dr. Maldonado, can you highlight a little bit more about what we're looking at? Can you explain what a raceway is? Can you explain how you actually do water samples? What does a sick coral look like versus a healthy coral? I mean, how do you know that a sunscreen, for example, might be making them sick? Okay, lots of questions. I'll try to answer all of them. Sorry, if I yeah. forget anyone, you let me know. Uh, so the raceways are kind of, it's kind of a nice say, way of saying a giant kind of water bath that we can put the corals in. And they call it a raceway because we actually have water running through them. A coral is often like, like flowing water, clean flowing water. So we'll have them in there. Um, they'll often feed at night with zooplankton. So we need that flowing water so they can have food at night as well. And uh, they like this water movement as well. So that's kind of why we have those giant raceways. It's also ways where we can put tanks in them and keep the tanks in the same temperature. All of them that we're doing a study on them, we can all be kept at the same temperature. So having that water bath around them kind of keeps the temperature the same. Um, so corals, looking at a healthier or a non-healthy coral, that's a really great question because I feel like a lot of times when people go diving, they don't know if they're seeing a healthy coral or a dead coral, live coral. It, it takes some time to kind of recognize that. Um, but you kind of see behind me here, these are live, beautiful coral, and they all have their tissue on them. And one way of realizing that a coral is not doing okay is when they bleach. And so corals get their color from their zooxanthellae, these tiny kind of algae that live symbiotically with them, and that's where they get their color. And so when they excrete those, they turn this white pale color, and we know that they're not doing well. That's already very, very bad. And we can go on and on about climate change with that, but that's not a good sign. So one way of telling it is coral bleaching. We can also see if the tissue is kind of falling off the, the skeleton. Um, that's also one way of telling that it's being harmed. But honestly, right now, um, what my lab and a collaborator in Hawaii are working on is that we're working on molecular techniques to try to tell if corals are sick before we can see it. Because right oh, cool. now, some of our best techniques are when we can see them, but we're trying to develop ways where we can measure how corals are healthy, if not by just taking a little sample and putting it in the lab. So that's that is so cool. So you're doing coral reef preventative care. Mm -hmm. That's wild. Oh my gosh. I love that. All right. So Melissa, similar question. 
So basically, I know that you do a lot of field research, and you work with this amazing group of volunteers and other scientists called the Sea Turtle Patrol. So can you shed a little light on what all of that is about? And then we actually have a video we can play to actually show you what Sea Turtle Patrol looks like in action. But before we look at what we're talking about, let's talk about what we're going to be looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have an amazing group of volunteers. Um, we've got about 300 people that dedicate their summer uh, to protecting the sea turtles on our on our coast. We've got uh, volunteers, most of them uh, go out and flag new activities and tell us where that is so that the staff and interns can go out and document that. Um, but many of them uh, are also permitted as well to do the work. And so they help us uh, beyond belief um, in collecting our data. Uh, so all, all 35 miles of our beach is walked every single morning of sea turtle nesting season, looking for new crawls, looking for um, anything that might've happened to a nest, whether a predator dug into it or uh, it hatched. If it hatched, we wanna make sure that all the hatchlings went the right way. Or what's being shown in the video is what happens after a hatch um, where we excavate the nest and count how many eggs hatched, how many didn't hatch. Um, and take any of the hatchlings uh, and release them so that they can join the population as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the elevator speech for what Turtle Patrol does, um, but it's the same kind of thing where not every day is the same. Turtles are very unique individuals. And so even though we're doing the same types of things every day, we're seeing a whole plethora of um, behaviors from them. So it's always exciting. Gosh, that's really exciting. So as you mentioned, you work with a lot of different sea turtles. So what species do we work with most frequently? Do you see, any, so we obviously get repeat visitors from 50 plus years, which is so exciting, but what species do you interact with? And then what are the protocols to handle those sea turtles differently or similar? Or what's a day in the life of a sea turtle tracker tagger look like? <laughs> Yeah, so the majority of our nesting in our area is done by loggerhead sea turtles. Um, loggerheads are uh, very important to Florida, or, and Florida is very important to loggerheads. as where the majority of um, the world's loggerheads nest. And so uh, mostly what we see is that. We do also uh, regularly get green turtles nesting here. Um, they're much more rare for us to see, but we do see them every year. And then on very rare occasions, we'll see some other species like a Kemp's Ridley or a leatherback. Uh, last year, we had some leatherback nests, which um, those guys are very rare here. They're very uh, East Coast Florida nesters. <laughs> um, but we have so many loggerheads nesting here that our protocol for them involves a sampling scheme where we don't actually collect all of the data on all of those nests because there are so many. Last year, we had about 4,500, almost 5,000 loggerhead nests on our beaches. Um, but the other species, because they're more rare, um, we collect all of the data on all of those nests. So that's the, the biggest difference um, for us based on the species. Gosh, that's so amazing that you get to work with so many different types of turtles. I'm green with envy. Now, the neat thing is, before we dive in and talk a little bit more about the hardcore nitty gritty science of what's impacting these animals, I do just selfishly want to ask, what are your favorite research stories? Because I know school's out for a lot of people, but that doesn't mean you stop doing your research. So we'll go to Melissa first and then jump back to Dr. Maldonado. But do you have like one favorite awesome research story you want to share with us? Um, aside from seeing uh, Salty, the turtle that nested again last night, uh, again this year, uh, and you know, looking back at how old she is and how many times she's been seen nesting here, um, the thing that sticks out the most to me is how crazy our numbers have been lately. We've been mm -hmm. seeing exponential increase in nesting mm -hmm. on not only our coast, but all of Florida, which is uh, a really good sign uh, for things for these species um, because they ha were in such bad shape 30 years ago. Oh, gosh, that is so inspirational. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, Dr. Maldonado, what about you? Do you have like one standout awesome research adventure story? Anything you want to share? Um, I guess, uh, I guess mine is not as uh, that's very wonderful for the sea turtle populations. I guess mine is more cool in the sense, in the sense that just me and interaction that I got to see under mm. the ocean that 
I was helping my friend Katie, Katie Flowers do research with spotted eagle rays and we were following and tracking spotted eagle rays with GoPros, which was amazing in itself. But then as I was filming, I got distracted and a big fish swam under me and a shark was following it and attacked it. And I got to see that interaction which I'd never seen in real life. And it was terrifying, but amazing. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience that I got to see. And yeah. That and it's so of- wonderful that as an ecotoxicologist, your work is indirectly impacting these animals so that you are working with just ocean health in general. Mm-hmm. So even though you're not studying sharks per se, that mm-hmm. shark's healthy habitat is also thanks to your science. So thank you for keeping the oceans healthy in general which is a perfect transition to one of the main topics we want to cover today. So we're talking about sandcastles. We're talking about sunscreens. We want to talk about the impacts that beachgoers have on the beach ecosystems. You go to the beach during the summer. What are ways that we can help? But also, what's just going on out in the world? So we'll go back to Dr. Maldonado. The question that is actually currently flooding the chat box right now is reef safe sunscreens. We see this on so many different brands. Can you just like tell us what to expect? What is the science behind Reef Safe Sunscreen? Can you recommend a brand? Can you recommend science? Can you recommend an ingredient we should watch out for? Just help. (laughs) Tell me what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll kind of step back a little. And then if I go too far, let me know. (laughs) But it kind of starts with UV radiation, right? The point that we use sunscreen is to protect our skin from UV radiation. And there's kind of two types, UVA and UVB. And UVA is the one that causes wrinkles. So a lot of older folks, you know, you're worried about that one. That's the one that actually causes wrinkles. And UVB is the one that actually you burn. And the reason I mentioned those is because um, there really are two types of sunscreens, main ones. One is the chemical one, and one is the mineral one. Hmm. And so the chemical sunscreen actually has active ingredients that are like oxybenzone, and I can rattle on many, many different other compounds. <laughs> and what happens is that sun hits your skin, and when you put that sunscreen in, actually, the chemical one either absorbs it and then turns it into heat absorbs it and reflects it, or there's other chemical reaction that happens. So that's the chemical one. And because these chemical ones, not any single compound is very good at it, they put many compounds. So there's up to 20 different compounds in your sunscreen Mm. that help protect you from, uh, you know, from sunburning or getting, you know, cancer and things like that. And oftentimes, uh, these compounds can be found, people think they only find it in your sunscreen, actually, Oxybenzone, this compound is actually found in nail polish, shampoo, uh, Mm. lotion, lip gloss, uh, pretty much you name it. It's in so many different products and people don't really realize that. Mm. Um, And that's the reason it can be kind of detrimental to the environment because so much of it is being produced right Mm. now and putting it on your skin that actually can cause harm to corals. And there are some studies that show it can cause harm and very small doses can cause kind of some effects on humans as well. Mm. Um, About, you know, the way it works is it absorbs into your skin, about 4% is actually absorbed into it and to your bloodstream. And they've done studies where they found that 96% out of 2000 people tested in the US, they were able to measure oxybenzone in their urine. Oh God, (laughs) okay. Yeah. (laughs) So it's compound is pretty much everywhere. And it can, uh, it's been linked to cause harm to coral reefs and other marine organisms as well. Um, And, and, and has been shown to be absorbed into the tissue of humans and and may have endocrine disruption effects. All right. So you just said endocrine disruptors. That's a really big fancy science word. So what is that? And is that's what, is that the issue with corals? Like what does it do to corals? I mean, we don't want corals to get sunburned. So what's the problem, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we don't want them to get sunburned, but uh, so the corals, it actually has been linked to increasing the chances of coral bleaching. So we mentioned mm. that earlier, uh, with increased temperatures, bleaching is more of an effect. And when they, the sunscreen in combined with the sunscreen chemical, they found that it increases the ability of these for the corals to be bleached. There are also other effects as well. They believe that can disrupt the hormone levels of the corals and different things. There's still so much research that needs to be done. Uh, there really isn't 
enough research out there to understand completely how what long-term impacts may have on corals. But right now the data does support that it definitely may cause harm to the corals uh, and other marine organisms. Um, and to give you an idea of, you know, you're like, okay, well maybe I just put sunscreen and I go in the water. It's not a big deal. It's not very much. Right, but it's never overall, me, right? It's someone else. Yeah. yeah. It's someone else. <laughs> I put my, I only put a little bit of sunscreen. Right, well, right. In total, annually, there's about four, they estimate 4,000 to 14,000 tons a year get into the water. Huh. Wow. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, good to know. Now, uh, so on a similar but also equally concerning level, let's jump over to Melissa. So, Melissa, I love going to the beach. Now I'm nervous about my sunscreen, but what about <laughs> beach toys? Like, I don't have to worry about any of that, right? I mean, if I bring my beach toys back home with me, there's no issue. So what's the problem here? Yeah, so sea turtles uh, nest on the beach at night, and so most people don't get to ever see it, um, but anything that they've left behind on the beach can potentially be a problem for a sea turtle. So uh, sea turtles can get stuck under chairs pretty regularly if you've left your beach chair out, um, or uh, if in this example there's a cable tying these uh, kayaks up and the turtle crawled all the way up there and got stuck in that um, as well. And so they have very small brains and they're not very cognitive in their uh, execution of nesting. It's very instinct driven. So they are just doing what they know to do. And if something comes up in the way, it can cause a problem for them because they're not cognitively thinking about how to avoid an obstacle. They're just going in the direction that they're going. Um, so even small holes dug in the beach for hatchlings can cause really big problems. Um, we fairly regularly get uh, hatchlings that get stuck in holes, um, like in this picture here. Um, the, even some big holes, we've had large turtles stuck in holes. Um, so anything that's not a natural beach uh, can cause a problem for these guys. Yikes. So even if you bring your beach toys home with you, make sure that you bulldoze that sandcastle because the moats around the sandcastle can cause those poor little hatchlings to get to yeah. fall in and never make it out to the ocean. Be aware of your your beach chairs. Oh my gosh, I never even thought about that. And then so sea turtles, as Melissa said, aren't as aware when they're making these nests. So I mean, I feel like all of our cognitive abilities kind of go down during the summer. So I can relate, but oh my gosh, this is really good to know. Now we're getting a question that's coming in for Melissa. So regarding, can you talk a little bit more about false crawls? And then at what point does a sea turtle stop laying eggs in general? Uh, sure, those are kind of different, but so I'll start with the right. false crawls. <laughs> um, false crawl is the, the layman's term for a non-nesting emergence, where as a sea turtle crawls out of the ocean looking for a spot to nest, but ultimately does not lay eggs. Um, and this can happen naturally. It is not always because she hits something or is scared by something. There may just be um, some condition to that beach isn't what she's looking for. Um, so it could be a natural thing, but it can also happen if she encounters an obstacle um, like a chair, a stack of chairs, an umbrella, a seawall. If the beach has gotten really short, she may come up and hit a seawall and realize there's no beach here and turn around. Mm -hmm. um, any of those things, uh, as well as people on the beach, if you encounter a turtle and she isn't to the point of nesting and she gets spooked, she could turn around immediately and leave without uh, depositing her eggs. Um, and we try to uh, educate people to not be on the beach at night for this reason, because it's a lot of energy for these animals to crawl out of the ocean. They are very well adapted for swimming in the ocean, but they are not very well adapted for crawling on the beach. They weigh hundreds of pounds and um, put a lot of effort into just crawling. And so if they've gotten all the way up on the beach and then you come out and shine your flashlight in their direction mm -hmm. and they spook, they've wasted a lot of energy at that point. So we try wow. to encourage people to not go out looking for the turtles at night for that reason. Um, I don't remember what the second question oh, was. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, perfect transition. So speaking of laying eggs and making those nests, is there an age that they normally stop laying eggs? No, sea turtles cool. do not experience senescence that, that's known, um, <laughs> which is the fancy word for going through a menopause. They don't have that phase of their life. Um, once a sea turtle reaches 
uh, sexual maturity, she will or he will continue mating and nesting until they no longer can and they die at that point. Good um, to so, know. So Salty, who came up last night and is at least 57, uh, she could be seen for another 30 years nesting on our beach. We don't know uh, how long she's going to live for, but um, we hope we'll see her again regularly going forward. That's awesome. So if they can, they will, which is another really important reason to make sure that our summer habits per encourage sea turtles to make nests, which is the perfect lineup for our next polling question. So I hope everyone was paying attention and got your thinking caps on. So get ready because our next polling question is going to talk about ways that you think you can save both sea life and your summer vacation. So what do you think is the best way to save summer and sea life? To only take pictures, leave only footprints, reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse, support environmental nonprofits. What do we think is the best way? Hmm. Okay, so this one's more split down the middle. How exciting. Oh man, so it looks like A and B. Awesome. All right. Well, it's really exciting to think what you think you can do in order to help protect ocean life and just beach going habits in general. So as it stands right now, the correct answer is, sorry for a trick question, all of the above. <laughs> so all of those are great ways to help both your beach habits and help marine life in general. So I want to turn it over to Melissa because she has a really awesome grant she wants to talk about. And I see that we unfortunately are starting to run out of time. So I want to open it up to Melissa to talk about her sea turtle grants and any other final feedback. So how are sea turtle nesting doing? I know you said they're doing well. So what's the current state? And let's leave on a high note, right? Yeah, so uh, we'll talk about the grant first because it expires on June 1st is the last state of vote. It's um, basically the most votes gets gets the grant. And so we are trying to share, spread the word as much as possible to help um, our program get a, a $5,000 grant, which is gonna go a long way for us in buying stakes and markers and data sheets and all the reusable things that we have to go through every year, especially because our run, which is our big fundraiser that happens in April has been postponed indefinitely because of mm. the virus. So. Um, we ha don't have that fundraiser this year, so we're hoping everyone will vote for us to get a little bit uh, of something to help us go through. Um, because we have so many more nests every single year, they're still endangered species and threatened species. Uh, so it is still a concern uh, how they're doing, but numbers are looking good. And as the numbers go up, uh, we are becoming more and more uh, <laughs> thinly spread uh, to cover all of our duties. So every little bit helps helps us as well. That's awesome. So for all of you who don't know, Moat Marine Laboratory is a nonprofit marine laboratory and research, it costs money. So one of the best ways to give back no matter where you are in the world is just financially supporting Melissa and Dr. Maldonado and all of her amazing research. So, all right, so flipping over to Dr. Maldonado. So do you have any final closing statements? I see that we have a question about so are mineral sunscreens the safer choice? What are some closing statements? If you can shed light, I know there's a lot of research that still needs to go into this, but help, what do we do? <laughs> yeah, I would say that uh, the next time you go get sunscreens, I would agree with the mineral ones. Hmm. So mineral ones are not only better for the environment, but they're also better for your skin. Uh, zinc oxide actually covers the entire spectrum of UVA and UVB, just that chemical alone. And so it doesn't look as pretty because it kind of covers you white colored, but it is better for the environment. Um, I recommend putting it on multiple times when you're at the beach and also using other ways of covering up your skin. I actually am wearing one of those, which is whale shark pants here. I don't know if you can, you can't really see them here, but it's really cool whale shark pants and like covering yourself up in different ways where you don't need as much sunscreen also helps. Wearing a t-shirt, wearing a hat, wearing sunglasses, cool underwater, you know, cool stuff like that can really help the ocean whenever you go snorkeling. And even when you're not snorkeling, a lot of people think, well, if I'm on land, then I can just use the regular sunscreen. That still ends up in the environment. So I would just recommend always using the zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. And it's just easy to look at the back of the label. What's the active ingredient? 
and making sure that it doesn't have any of those other ingredients in it as well. Awesome. So that is so I'm good to know. Yeah. So you might not have the most fashion forward summer with just being covered in white sunscreen, but we can make a fashion sacrifice in order to help protect the, the state of coral reefs and just ocean health in general. Now, before we start wrapping up this program, we have an awesome guest celebrity joining us in this presentation. We're joined by our volunteer manager, Cassie. Now, there are lots of ways to help support Moat, whether it's financial contributions to the research Dr. Maldonado is contributing, as well as the work that our Sea Turtle Patrol and Melissa is doing. So we're going to open it up to Cassie. Now, we're going to unmute her. We're going to pull her up. And we're going to ask, how can I actually, in person, volunteer? Or can I volunteer remotely? So Cassie, help. How can I give back, no matter where I am? Oh. I'm so sorry, you're muted. <laughs> All right, there, we, let's see. All right, there we go, perfect. All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, great question, Ross. And, you know, being where we are, we have so many incredible volunteers, about 1,700 almost, that help in areas across research. So we have, like Ms. Melissa said, almost 300 folks doing sea turtle patrol, but we also have volunteers that help with animal care and research and um, interpreting our science for guests. So there's lots of on-site things to do. Um, we don't have a ton of remote volunteer opportunities, but as you mentioned, there's lots of ways to support um, in other ways, like animal adoptions or contributing to different scientific organizations that are doing uh, a lot of the legwork for conservation out there. Gosh, that is such an awesome answer. So whether you adopt an animal, whether you become a member of Moat itself, there's also some really fun opportunities for citizen science programs. So if you just have a smartphone and go to the beach, you can download some of Moat's free apps where if you notice a red tide bloom or you notice a sick manatee, those are great ways to contribute to Moat's research no matter where you are in the world. And if you are local, it would be a great opportunity to consider becoming a Sea Turtle Patrol member or even buying a reef safe license plate to support Dr. Maldonado's research. Now, unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time, which is such a bummer. However, for all of you individuals who we unfortunately didn't have time to get to your questions, we have an amazing resource that we want to share with you. Whether you have a question for Dr. Maldonado, Melissa, or even Cassie regarding volunteering, please join us on our Flipgrid page. Flipgrid is a wonderful service where it's a free video voicemail website. So you can leave us a free video question and we will respond with a personalized video answer. If you got a coral question or a sunscreen question, we'll turn it over for Dr. Maldonado. If you have a sea turtle question, we'll turn it over to Melissa. And if you have any volunteering questions, we'll turn that over to Cassie. Now, one final thing we have to mention, it's Cassie's birthday. So happy birthday, Cassie. Oh my gosh. Thanks for tuning in <laughs> on your birthday. birthday. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so unfortunately we are out of time. This was such a blast. We have a lot more fun webinars coming up next month. So make sure that you stay tuned to Moat Events page as well as C-Trek TV. Follow us on social media and to go out and spread one thing that you learned about our program today. Because the more we share about what we learned here and Moat's research, the more we care about the oceans in general. So make sure that you go out and share some of the fun facts. We learned so much. So I want to give a giant thank you to all three of our guest experts, Dr. Maldonado, Melissa, and Cassie. Thank you so much. Any final things you want to say before we unfortunately have to wrap up? We can start with uh, Melissa, if there's any final statements. Um, the best way to be turtle friendly is to keep the beach as natural as possible. So build your sandcastle, dig your hole, and at the very end of the day, kick it down, pick up trash, take your chairs with you, and leave it flat, dark, and beautiful. <laughs> Amazing. Fantastic. So leave, uh, take only pictures, leave only footprints. <laughs> awesome. All right, Dr. Maldonado, any final closing statements? Nope. Just making sure that uh, check your sunscreens. You know, it, it, like you said, you know, even though you look a little white, you're saving the environment. So making sure you look at those sunscreens and you buy the right kind that are going to be safe for the environment.
gosh, this is so amazing. Well, thank you so much for everyone who tuned in today. This was an awesome webinar. We are live streaming this to YouTube. So once it is posted, make sure that you share out the YouTube recording so everyone knows about the amazing work Melissa and Dr. Maldonado are doing, how you can become a, a volunteer through Cassie, and what amazing research Moat is doing even during summer vacation. There's no vacation for scientists and these ocean savers. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day, a wonderful summer. World Oceans Day is coming up. So make sure you go out and celebrate that by picking up some trash, choosing sustainable sunscreen, and coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory. Once again, my name is Ross, and thank you so much for tuning in to today's program. Bye, everyone.